Greg Althaus. I'm a CTO and co-founder of Rackin. We do, well, we'll talk about what we do in a second. Um, this talk is immutable deployments taking physical infrastructure from automation to autonomy. Fancy words to say we're gonna deploy stuff on bare metal. Um, and hopefully in a repeatable, automatable, drivable way from an API, as an example. Um, the immutable part is that in our walkthrough tutorial kind of here, we'll be using an image-based deploy system that you could use to capture a system and redeploy um, as an example. So uh, what is Rackin and Digital Rebar? Rackin is a company, we have an open source project called Digital Rebar. We've been kind of playing with physical server autom automation for over eight years. We started out at Dell writing the Crowbar project and have kind of continued that moving forward for a while. We are now in our third version of the project called Digital Rebar uh, Provision. It's at version 3.8.2 is what we'll be playing with today. The reason we're using it as an example is a lightweight provisioner that replaces Cobbler. Um, so if you, as we kind of go through the hands-on part, if you have questions, Actually, if you have questions at all, just interrupt. I kind of like that. Um, and then I have Rob Hirschfeld, our CEO, is here too. And he will help with questions and others as we go along if you get stuck. Um, let's see. We, so what is Digital Rebar Provision? Digital Rebar Provision is an open source project that we kind of foster and move forward. It's a Pixie provisioner. It's very small. The idea is it's a Golang binary that can run on just about any platform. It's about 26 meg total and can run just about anywhere. We even theorize it could run the pop rack switch, for example. So you could actually distribute it across your infrastructure and use it to provision and control. It supports um, bare metal, though strangely enough with its plug-in model, you could actually use it to manage um, cloud infrastructures, virtualization infrastructures, if you want it as well. The model allows it, we just don't necessarily make that our corporate focus. Um, that's where you can go to learn more about it. These slides should be out in the slide share for the talk. Um, and there you go. So if you don't have to you know, worry about catching all this stuff. So what do we mean by modern provisioning? So, We've been very focused on letting you use your cloud-like primitives, the idea of creating and destroying things, operator level control of those pieces. We're very API focused, so that everything we will look at is actually backed by a RESTful API to which a UX is layered on top, but everything starts from that API. We have a CLI that's based upon that. The UX has been a single page JavaScript app, the idea that it uses the API as well, though it's air gappable and drivable. Like I mentioned, it's li uh, lightweight and portable. We actually have a community member who runs DRP on a Pi to manage his rack of gear. It works. Um, so it's an interesting kind of use case. Um, one of our philosophies is we believe in making everything visible, so logs are everywhere from what the actions taken on the machines as well as what's going on in the system. We also believe in fail fast. So we try and generate um, actions that are um, fairly small and atomic that you can get results from, see those results, remediate those actions and continue. Our history is from Chef and if you've ever been in the very painful process of dealing with a chef run list that's 15 recipes long and you don't know which one failed and you have to figure out was it the 10th one that failed or the sixth one that failed, those can be very painful. So our philosophy is make those separate, track them, get the results early. Um, digital rebar provision provides what we call a workflow system. This allows us to schedule these pieces of work across reboots and other cycles. So 
Some of the things we do is like discover machines, put them into inventory pools, gather information about them, let you then drive them through an installation process, drive that process to completion, consume the, the infrastructure, and then reset that back into the pool for use in the future. Driving pipeline use cases, you're again back to your cloud infrastructure kind of uses. Okay. And then the, the core components are extensible through a plugin system that allows you to add actions to pretty much all the objects, as well as there's a way to get events so that you can do things like notifications and handling of um, changes in the system as it goes through. Okay. The big goal with a lot of this is to provide flexibility to use the existing tooling you have. So part of what we found is as you go to deploy and make changes in your infrastructure management system, you can't in general just pick it all up and throw it away and start over. So you need ways to be able to incrementally add value in. And so part of what we try and do with digital rebar provision is allow you to turn on the pieces as you need them when you need them. So you can run the whole system using your existing IPAM until you decide that the IPAM needs to be altered or replaced. Right? And then you can use DRP as an IPAM. A light, big, small one, but potentially that may be all you need. Okay. Um, what does Rackin add on top of that? We have some UI experience stuff. Um, all of the endpoints are IPv6 native to start with. Um, that's a little tricky in Pixie land because most of that is IPv4 specification. But even that's beginning to change with some of the UPA, uh, UPI Pixie booting, which allows me to kind of booting as well. As well as some of the ARM infrastructures are showing up with some interesting bootloaders on their startup systems so you can actually get into v6 directly. Um, Rack and provide provides the UX in a air gap mode. So right now the UX is provided from a web portal that can be internalized for if you have security concerns. And then we have a different additional sets of features that um, we support because they require more maintenance than just having them out in the community. Things like image deployment from raw tarballs of root file systems to Windows DD images. Um, building images from existing systems. So like if you have an existing system, we have tasks that let you capture that system and then store it as an image that can then be reconstituted onto a bare metal system. We have Terraform plugins that you can drive all of this metal as if it were a cloud infrastructure resource. So if you're used to AWS EC2 instance, you can say DRP instance, and then a lot of your scripts will just continue on their normal, normal use. Out of event management, so one of the control points with metal is I need to be able to power it on, power it off, all of that. Racken provides tools to do those kind of services as well as configure the out of band management system in an automated way. We have hardware management pieces where you can configure your RAID, your BIOS, um, firmware updating. Um, like I said, Dell is easily supported today from our history and some of the super micro boxes as well. The underlying system's pluggable, so we can extend and add as we go. And then because of the plugin system, we can integrate with just about any, anything. Our recent one is, if you're familiar with Honeycomb IO, they're an external logging system, so you can point your log system to them. Um, we have a plugin that will take the DRP logs and push them directly into Honeycomb, so then that gets all aggregated and controlled and sortable, sortable searchable, and all this kind of thing. That's an example of how those other systems can be driven. We're working with some customers to do things like netbox integration. They want to do netbox as their single source of truth, right? DRP gathers a bunch of information that can then be injected into your inventory system as well. So what are we going to do? That's kind of the what we do and the tool we bring. So our plan for the day is to get everybody kind of ready to do the task. We're going to deploy digital rebar provision. We're going to then log into the SAS so we can access the UI. We'll get the content we need to do a image based deploy using Terraform. We'll configure our deployment images. We'll make sure we have access to packet.net so we can act like we're doing IPMI actions if we need to, to reboot them. Then we're going to use Terraform to, or we'll add the systems 
that we're going to manage. And then we'll image a system, we'll reset those systems through Terraform, and then do it again. And then if we're really bored, we'll go play with the Kubernetes. Um, questions? All right. <laughs> So the first part that you guys get to do is find a, on your system, bring up an SSH client. Okay? So you're gonna need a, a browser window of some kind, an SSH client. Those are the two things we'll need. And um, if you go to the URL at the bottom, you should get a big list of pages like that, something that looks kind of like that, okay? And if you don't have a piece of paper, we'll come to that in a second, okay? Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah, there's a bit of a jump starting problem. Okay, we good? I mean, it's kind of there really small on the top. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna want to do is then open the second URL and that will be the private key to access our packet nodes, okay? So if you're on a Mac or a Linux box, that's usually save that private key and then you do SSH-I with the name of the file you specified and then you go. If you're on Windows, I'm sorry. Um, I think that's usually something like putty and import private key file. Um, but that is less of my awareness. The other thing we're gonna need is um, Okay, the one other piece of fun is you will need the IP address for the number I gave you. So if you still need a number, let me know. Um, okay, it will be 14. Okay, if you have any handy dandy papers, you can write down your IP address if you want. Anybody else? So the idea is find your student number and write down that IP address that's next to it. And then you should be able to, and I can, let's see, we're up to 15. Something like that. And hopefully what we will do is we will SSH into those IP addresses. What we'll be using is this is a machine running out in packet.net. It's a small four gig machine and it has um, enough disks and internet access to be able to drive other machines. The goal of this is we'll install DRP on that and then we will hook some other machines into it to actually manage so that we can go through this function. Yeah. Um, I will be 17. All right, so you should be able to have something that looks like that when you're all said and done. Okay. If you're not there, let me know. Okay, the other thing to do is to bring up in your browser the SAS portal. And you can go to that. I have tip here. Um, Amazon was taking a while to propagate some things, but it's now out there. The default SAS is portal.racken.io, access through HTTPS. And if you go there, 
it looks like. Ah. Nope. <laughs> Maybe. Nope. There we go. Looks like that. This is a useful place to start because it actually contains the quick start guide, which is what we're actually going to be running through here through our slides um, and how we actually get into the system. Okay. So if you have all those up, we can begin the next steps. Yeah, so you can actually get to that. It's actually served through the same files as the, instead of going to info.txt, you can open student.info. Okay. Um, so at this point, uh -huh. Does anybody else need help getting SSH access to the oh, resource? Oh, sure. I thought it was I mean, I know, I know, I'm bad. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm bad for using root for these systems. Okay, I thought it was No, it's a, that's a good thing I wish I would have done, but we did root. Our system okay. sets up things as root for the most part, so. Okay. So realize it's a root user, my Should oversight. <laughs> yeah, and if you're SSHing it, it's just root. Yeah, it's root at the IP address of the private key. You go over here. Oh, okay. So you could be 15. <laughs> it's really easy. It's really easy to get it from Okay. Okay. So for, for Max, do they need to mod the key? You may need it at 600 or 644. <laughs> Okay, hopefully this is the painful part because from here on, the commands are actually in a happy little mouseable buffer. Okay, so at this point we have a CentOS 7 system. It's kind of already set up for us and we're good to go. Um, so the commands we want to run is we want to put the installer in a location and then we're going to run the installer, okay? Now, you can try and mouse it from my slides, but in the info.txt file, you'll see at the top, there's three commands you could grab to do that from this file if you wanted to, to save time on your whole typing cut and paste. So in this case, I'm going to take those commands, I will go dump them in and run. So DRP, why? I said it's very lightweight and small. It does require one extra binary tool. It's DSPTAR. DSPTAR is used to explode ISOs if you're actually going to do ISO-based ISO installs. Um, DSPTAR is particularly useful because it handles the weirdness that is like ESXi's ISO, which has some mixed case file system problem. So this runs, it will pull the, in this case, we're pulling stable, which is our latest release. You can actually pull tip if you wanted to get the bleeding edge. This should finish and say, hey, you're good. Oh. Um, oh, this is a side effect. Okay. Huh. So, um, I'll explain what's happening real quick. So here's the deal. 
if I can find my right browser. So this is the UI, and we use digital rebar provision to provision all 90 of these nodes because we actually handled it. And so we then used it to bring it up and it left a runner, which is the CLI, which actually runs the tasks for nodes to do. So what we need to do is just do kill all, uh, actually service DRP CLI, I think, no. Actually, how's that going to be? Yeah. Is that going to work? Oh, of course not. All right. So <laughs> I'm going to have to figure out the service. Sorry, just a second. Oh, well, that's convenient. Okay. So that is what you'll need to run. System cuddle stop DRP CLI. Hoping to avoid architectural discussion for a little bit, but um, the idea is that um, we use the CLI as a method to run tasks on the nodes we're provisioning. In this case, we left it running so that we could do additional tasks if we needed to. Um, by stopping up the install, should be able to finish this task. So you can just rerun that bash command or the install curl bash. The for those who aren't necessarily happy with curl bash as a method to install, the docs actually describe the, the actual install mechanism and decompose that bash script into something that if you wanted to see what was actually going on, you could follow along there. For those who didn't want to. All right, so this, you should see something like this at the end. You should see a bunch of run these syscuttle commands and then run some upload ISO commands. All right, once we're there, back to our document and move on to the next part. So while DRP is installed, we didn't necessarily start it or enable it. So the next step is to go ahead and start and enable it. So if we actually reboot the system, it can be handled. So let's do that. It's system cuddle space stop space DRP CLI. And so at this point, these commands are happily right above there. So we can grab those and run those. And at that point, we should have VR provision running. Okay. So the next step is we need to make a discovery image available. So the idea is that when machines boot, we want to have them discovered. So if they're pixie booting, we don't know about them, we pass them this thing we call the discovery image. Discovery image is actually a thing we call Sledgehammer, which is a CentOS 7 based RAM disk that has a bunch of tools that all inventory hardware and happens to know how to join into a digital rebar system. Okay, so we have to get that. So what we need to do is if you have that script up, you can see the last line that it probably printed was upload ISO ERP CLI. You should be able to um, run that and it will take a little bit because it's going to pull a 300 meg tarball to the system, so it shouldn't take too long. And you run that and then it'll say success. While that's running, we can open a new browser tab. And go to our IP address. In this case, you guys have yours written down. I didn't do that. 
My bad. Oops. Almost. Mm. You'll need to accept the self signed certificate. What was the form? Yeah, uh, 8092. And I will pull that back up in just a second. So you can also access this through the portal. There's a little bar at the top of in the middle of the page. If you enter your IP address colon 8092, click the little arrow, you'll get redirected to the UX as well. Now, if you go through just by typing it in directly, it'll ask you to do the self-signed certificate, kind of like mine did. And you should get to a screen like this. You can say default because we haven't changed any of the passwords and hit login. And then you should have a screen like that to actually control your digital root bar endpoint. Okay. Um, if you went through the portal, uh, wrong set of magic buttons, you will end, you can end up on that login screen. You'll get an error message saying, we don't know for sure how you were talking to this. That usually means you need to go set the self signed certificate, so you select that and it goes through. All right, um, <coughs> DRP has the ability to use um, custom built certificates, so um, you can actually inject your own if you wanted to. Okay, so at this point, we have a DRP endpoint installed, we're connected, and we can go look around. At this point, we want to get into the SAC so that we can get some of the content. Digital re uh, Rackin manages content and versions it so that it can be updated. DRP has a content system that allows you to keep track of versioned content so you can update it and replace it. Part of that's accessible to the system. So in your browser, I'll hop back up and I've already logged in here, but there's a button in the upper right. You can say, click on that, and it should take you to, actually, let's do this, something that looks like that, okay? And in the info text file, you will see I have given you a username. To put in as the email and a password to put in as a tool. And you should then log in. To get back to your endpoint, um, well, I'm not sure how you'll get back to your endpoint. There you go. You may have to use the back arrow a little bit. And then it should pop up something like that saying you're in the ITX training demo group. Okay. Um, if you don't get that, you might have to toggle this top bar here and change from the actual user to the org. So if you select the org, you should get that to indicate you're in the right group. Okay. So at this point, we have logged in. You should. Everybody's logged into the portal at this point. Who's following along at home? Okay. At this point, we want to accept a license. So we create licenses for all this content so we can play with it in here. Um, it'll be valid for a few days. Uh, click the update license button. Um, make sure that you selected the top or button.
Okay, so at that point, you should see at the bottom um, access to packet IPMI, image deploy, licensing, all that stuff. Okay. Good. Everything? Okay. So at this point, we're going to go and pull in some content packages. So if you select the nav bar under content package. So when I was talking about we have various content. These are things that there's some community content, there's racking content. You can actually write your own content packs and updates. So if you have your own method for installing this you really love it. You can build a content pack store and get how to pull it out, burden it, inject it into your DRPM point and your content. Change control, so it has tools in place to do your job. At this point, let's transfer Terraform. The task library. And we'll stop at those. And then we will need to go to plugin providers and select the top three items. And you can just select them and then they'll all move over. As you can see, there's also the virtual box like in my, so this is if you're actually leaving a Mac or a Linux box, the virtual box, it would let you do IPMI like actions against your local virtual box. When this finishes, we should have the content we need to actually do our deploys. So at this point, are, are we customizing an image basically? At this point, we are extending DRP to have additional features. So the, the content packages we added were to add things like a, a special stage for a workflow to indicate that a pool of nodes for Terraform to operate against. We were in, including a task library that says, here's a runner to install on the system to, to do additional install actions after we've done the image deploy. Uh, the plugins are providing uh, access to packet.net. So if I give it an API key, I can then do remote calls to packet to act like I'm doing IPMI like actions. And in this case, the image deploy tool set is being provided through the plugin. We're extending the features of DRP at this point, okay? Once you have those three things loaded, I think I had a happy slide for these. So to answer your question, what have we done? <laughs> we basically got the content we want to deploy, the plugins, and we have a basic image that we want our nodes to boot when they're discovered, okay? So now we want to actually configure the system to control machines. So at this point, we're going to create what we call some workflows. The workflows represent what we call stages. And the stage is something like install CentOS, put uh, inventory of the box, right? Something like that. And I want to be able to link those together into a chain of actions so that I can end at the end a system that's deployed. Okay. So we're going to create two workflows. So we head over to the workflow page. From here, we click add and we type discover. Well, we try and type discover. Okay. And I like to kind of make a present and we'll make this purple and I'll save it. So now I have a discover workflow, but it has no stages. Okay. So at this point I want to oh. <laughs> Okay, so then you can drag your discover. You want to drag packet discover and Terraform ready. Ah. Assuming I, uh-oh, stop. 
going into it. Hmm. Okay, my browser is confused now. Hmm. Note to self, don't use Safari. <laughs> Okay, how are others doing on making their workflows? Uh, Terraform ready if you can grab it. So you should have three workflows. The idea is that the initial discover stage does initial inventory. We run packet discover, it runs some additional tasks that do things like let me register, let me gather information about it. And then you run the Terraform ready stage, which marks the nodes available in a pool, but not assigned. So I can go look at these stages and I can go see like discover loads really small is going to run two tasks. One is called go high, which is our inventory tool. And then it's going to make sure that SSH keys are put on the box if they're defined as parameters. And then the next step will be running packet discover, which in this case runs a set of tools to set parameters about packet on the, the systems. And so what that ends up looking like, well, actually, we'll just go see. We'll just keep going. Okay, so we have our workflows. We need to add one more workflow. Okay. So um, on my screen, I have the full browser. I still have a bug to fix in the UX. If you're having issues finding and dragging things, the filter can be your friend to shorten the search to drag straight across. Okay. Now we want to add one more workflow. We're going to call this our image workflow. So we're going to click add. And we're going to type image. And in this case, I'm going to give it an icon of Linux, and I'm going to make it green because, well, I can. And so in there, I want to take and put my image deploy. And then I want my cloud init because the image we're going to use actually has a cloud init in it. Then I'm going to put my runner service. And then because I want Terraform to know I'm done, I'm going to put the complete stage, which doesn't do anything but mark the system as complete. That way Terraform can know, oh, it's done, and then continue on. Um, I'll leave that up there. I did, yeah. Yeah, so um, in this order, image deploy, image deploy cloud net, runner service, and complete. Now you'll notice, as you get them in there, you pick up this red swirly in the middle. What that indicates is there's going to be a reboot in between them. The idea is that workflows allow you to manage state across the reboots of the system. 
So in this case, we're going to image it because it's then going to reboot into the new image. And then we're going to serve the cloud init pieces. We're going to make sure the runner service is running and minimal mark the system. That way, Terraform doesn't wake up in the middle of the system reboot. This allows us to actually have that cloud kind of like infrastructure where EC2 instance comes back when it's up versus your bare metal, which could be in reboot land for a long time. Huh? I'm trying to go back to the plugin slider. Uh -huh. It transfers those to the motion. Uh -huh. Okay, so what is your. Uh, I probably will come down. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm going to send them one down. Sorry. Just update some of these. Okay, so we're going to actually transfer. It was basically if you so you can see what's wrong. There's a lot. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I mentioned before that we like to give logs and stuff. So what's going on on the system? If you go to logs, you can see output there for what DRP thinks is happening. And then as we go through, we'll see the actual jobs running here in a minute. Okay. So does everybody's workflow look somewhat like this? Okay, we'll wait just a minute. Let me, I'll select discover. Um, if you select the entry, you'll get the list there. And then the same thing if you have the second one. Uh, oops. You should be able to see the other side. Just one pack that I see in my plugin provider still have to install. Okay. Transfer. Did the others transfer? Yeah. So you may need to refresh your system because depending on how the job is notified in your system. Yeah, well, realize um, one of the things that's kind of strange in this setup. DRP actually doesn't talk back to the SAS. For security reasons, we don't want DRP actually contacting the SAS. Mm -hmm. The browser acts as a go-between. So when you're actually uploading that content, it's actually coming to your browser and going to the DRP endpoint. That way you can deal with firewall issues if you need to. Um, it also means that DRP isn't actually interacting with the outside world. <laughs> What are the stages that are supposed to be in Discover? Uh, okay. can, you, can you make that a little bigger? No. Okay. <laughs> so there's the Discover side. Discover, Packet Discover, and uh, Terraform Ready. And the idea is that any new box that I have, I'm going to drive through that Discovery st stage. It's going to be inventory discovered and then put into a pool for consumption. Okay, and then the same thing occurs with the image when I actually apply that. I wanted to go through those stages to get to the Okay, so go to your content. The idea is that these items are composable and versioned independently, so you can keep track of them separately. And in fact, one of the things to realize, um, are we good with discover? I'll switch to image. Is that if you click on the nav, um, I'll leave this one out, but if you click on like the nav and select uh, boot environment, for example, boot environments are these environments that we're going to boot into. Frankly, no. Naming is not our specialty. Um, and so things like local is a boot environment, which basically is the thing DHCP that says boot from your local disk. Discovery image is a boot environment as well. It says boot sledgehammer. The installers, right, if you're doing your traditional Kickstarter pre-seed, um, those commands at the end of the installer were putting in place ISOs 
for you to do like an Ubuntu 1604 install through a pre seed mechanism, right? That's in community content. Um, if you just add the ISO, that boot environment will be ready, right? I'll show you that real quick. So the idea is that these are some of the default boot environments that we, we have, right? CentOS install, Debian 8.9, Ubuntu, right, of various forms. Notice they have X's by them right now. That means they're not available. So if I go look at them, I can say, okay, what's wrong? And so it says I'm missing an ISO. So if I upload an ISO, which was one of the commands that DRP spit out at the beginning, it would have made the ISO pull that in, exploded it, and made it available as a boot in. We're not going to do that unless we have time. If, if we don't have a runner service, what can we uh, You need to add task library in your content packages. Okay. I'm going too fast. Okay. So hopefully you should have workflows that look like this now. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Oops. Oops. That one looks kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. So then we got one more annoying thing that we kind of have to do and then things will hopefully get a little more exciting. We have to create a profile. Now, a profile in our system is a collection of parameters. Parameters represent things we want to do about the system. In this case, we're going to define some image parameters that we're actually going to use to actually deploy our image. And our image is going to be a CentOS root tarball okay, that we've already built um, in this case. So we're going to tell the create a profile and say, these are the parameters that represent that. Eventually, we'll put that profile on the machine, and the machine will inherit those, and as it goes through the process, it can drive it. That allows us to do things like I can create a CentOS image, an Ubuntu image, and then depending on what I want a machine to become, I can put those profiles on the machine, and then they become what they profiles dictate. Okay. So to do that, we're going to come over here, and we're going to go to profiles. We're going to click add. And in this case, we called it CentOS-Linux. And because I like, well, I don't, but Rob likes icons. All right, so the fun part is we need to add those parameters to the profile. So in here, we type image, and we can see then we have image deploy file. And we say add. And then in the box, actually, do I have this? Oh, I don't. Very sorry. Okay. So I'm going to leave this up. So in here, you two, you type in the. Oh, let me get this. <laughs> Yeah, it's files slash images, files slash images slash CentOS dot TGZ. So effectively that. Okay, and then you just, in the box right below that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Let me do this real quick. Uh, OS is going to be Linux, and then you do the same image deploy, and you select type, and in this case, it's TGZ, and then once it's done, you say add, you should end up with something that looks like
Okay. It'll put quotes around it. Don't put quotes yourself. It'll, it'll quote the reviews block. Um, I was mentioning that this is actually a RESTful API. Um, it's JSON based, so like that's the default JSON for a profile, for example. Um, so you can script and drive and use other mechanisms for configuring this as well. Okay. Like I need to take you out for a beer and come up with Okay. Good over here. Okay. So the next thing. <laughs> Hopefully, then we'll start adding machines to people. Okay. The last part is we need to tell DRP what to do in certain kind of default situations. So we need to set the default workflow. So when a machine shows up and we don't know about it, what workflow should it get? Get nothing. In this case, we actually want it to get the discover workflow. So in here, we select discover. And then if it shows up without a stage, we'd like it to get the discover stage. And the boot end is sledgehammer. And then the really important one is the unknown. So if a machine, if something tries to boot, and we don't have a machine entry for it in DRP, what should it boot? In this case, we want it to boot the discovery image which says, well, add it to my inventory. Okay, and then save. Don't forget to save. Okay. Okay. Everybody got that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's discover, discover, sledgehammer, discovery, because I can't name things consistently at all. That's right. The box in the upper right. You can also set other things here, like if you wanted to see really in-depth detail about DHCP logging or rendering or various other things, you can turn on logging here and then they'll show up on the logging tab or in system output. So on that center box, I got discovery, no, 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 no. You should have both. One of the things to realize is DRP is actually a templating engine as well. So all of these things are actually backed by expanding templates with take these parameters and put them in place and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of logging you can get on that too, rendering. We're just kind of touching the surface on some of these things. Um, all right, so I've got that. So now we're going to go into the CLI. We need to get that CentOS image onto our systems. So if you go to your SSH environment and you bring up your info command, you'll see a git deploy image. You should be able to mouse those three commands. And it should go fairly quickly. Hopefully. And you should. Yep. Oh. So be careful you're not pasting this into your shell. It's slow to download that file. 
<laughs> yes, this is all intended to be run in the packet system because it's being served from a packet system. So it'll be faster. Um, all right. Oh, I didn't remove it just to save space. It doesn't really matter if you remove that or not. So at this point, you should have an image um, on your system. Digital Rebar has a TFTP directory that it does serve images out of. And so you can see it got moved into position. So var live, since we installed it using a perfection kind of level install, it put it in var live, PR provision, TFTP root files, images, CentOS, TVs. You could put all sorts of things in there if you wanted and serve those to your machines as they boot. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I was doing for my files for my class. All right. Um, at this point, I think we can skip this for the moment um, and we'll come back if we need it. Okay. We can configure a plugin to actually access this. Um, they're in there. I talk about how to do it. Um, it's only needed if we want you guys to do the IPMI commands. Um, let's just get machines in for the now and then we'll come back to adding this. Okay. Because that's the part I'm not. Right, but we're not going to do that for this pass. Okay. So at this point, I get to reboot y'all's machines. <laughs> well, hopefully not those machines, but let me find my browser of choice. All right. So here they are. <laughs> <clears throat> So, so what I'm doing is we've configured these systems to boot from your machines. So I'm going to set them up and have them reboot, hopefully within a couple of seconds, minutes, maybe. They will join your systems. And you should see them show up kind of like they look like here. If you go to your Let's see, I think we have 16, I think I was 17, don't need to do 18. So I've got those, of course I did it in the wrong window. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, let's try it again. All right. And that's these reasons they can show up So what happens, yeah, so to be loud, um, packet allows you to have a custom OS. And in that case, it basically says, give me an IP address. So what we've done is we've pointed the system initially at this master one. We then went back through and wrote a script that updated the use of your individual node based upon that. And then as they reboot, they should come over. You see where people use like uh boot key or something like that, uh the the nodes where the the server is. Okay. And so in packet, they have their own data seeking about. We don't get to the so they're working on that. In this case, we're not using DRP as a So we're using theirs, and we basically said, move the node to this IP of the next server using this IP. Okay. You can do that with your own DHCP server as well if you already have a DHCP info block, whatever, right? A lot of times you can say, here's the next DRP actually has a DHCP subsystem, 
So you actually have a whole networking set of things. So you can configure your own subnets. It'll be a DHCP server for your environment. So that it could be the next server, right? It'll give it you the answer. Manage that data directly, give out the next server, specify an appropriate file. The provisioner and DHCP server when you run this way of DRP are tightly coupled. So that if you actually want it to be locally, it actually won't give back a DHCP uh, file. So I think you go to the to the um, We actually configure additional options and all this kind of traditional things. Um, the DHCP server also can operate in proxy mode. In general, we don't see data centers doing this a lot, but we do see like labs or if you're doing it at home you can actually boot your system that off your home router using DRP as a proxy DHCP server so that when you boot your own netbox or network box it gives a boot file and stuff to achieve some they should be starting to show up yeah. it, in a traditional environment do you also uh, do you see like one DRP hey. server out there or multiple uh, so my use case is mostly wrong right now. <laughs> right, right. And, and in some regards, that's fine. Um, two things come to mind on that question. One is scope of control. Um, and then like who controls networking and those kind of things. And then the next level is um, in general performance is not an issue with DRP mm -hmm. from a scaling perspective. It's more of do I want to do failure default domains? In a rack or those kind of things, where you start thinking about the, the issues there. Um, there's no good direct guidance of only do it this way. Um, we try to avoid that. We, just, we want you to make the right decision here. All right, so you should have something like this, hopefully. Please. Everybody good? Did you get a. Some machines are cookier than others. Yeah, yeah. No. All right, so hopefully you have now discovered two machines. So now if you click on the name of one, you can go see what all was discovered and run. So you'll see the set of tasks that it ran through, right? That's the set of actions it took. Um, in this case, since I have a little green box by the task that indicates it's done. And then you'll see it discovered a whole bunch of stuff, right? So like I've got a whole bunch of inventory information. So like this system is apparently running on a to be filled in super micro system, right? But that's its serial number. I can find out what memory, what type of memory, right? All those kind of pieces of information. Also, since it's in packet, we also figured out what the SSH console is. So if I SSH to this, I can see the packet serial console that they provide. That way I can see what's going on on the systems if I want to debug them. We recorded that information from packet, so it's available, okay? Notice we also picked up two other parameters on the node. These were added as part of the Terraform ready state. This represents that it's not been allocated by a Terraform instance, but it's ready to be managed by Terraform, okay? One of the things to realize in DRP, parameters can be set atomically. So the RESTful API actually lets you do a test and set operation. This allows us to do things like I have a pool of 20 machines and I have 20 engineers that want to go grab a machine from that pool using a Terraform plugin. They can safely grab a machine that they get in their own. Okay. The RESTful API behind DRP allows atomic operations on all the objects. Okay. All right, so I have a machine or two. Um, let's see, machines have showed up. All right, oh my gosh, it seems like we're doing everything. All right, so now we need Terraform. So you should have in the info script these nine or 10 lines that you should be able to just mouse and run. That'll go pull Terraform, extract it, put it into user local bin, make sure it's runnable, and get rid of the zip. 
And then to do the same thing with the BRP plugin that lets Terraform manage BRP. Okay. So let's go do that real quick. Yeah, this is on the in the node itself. So in here you'll see these and the happy chat. Oops. On the on the um, DRP node that we SSH'd into earlier, that apparently many of us got disconnected from, but need to reconnect to. Apparently, I think I may have. I bet I have. I, <laughs> I bet my Mac has a special entry for packet systems that says "Don't time out." <laughs> so we run that. Um, That'll take hopefully not very long at all. This is getting Terraform set up. Who's familiar with Terraform? For those who aren't, Terraform is a scripting-ish kind of stanza language to do actions against things, of which you give it resources. The resources are provided by plugins or internal. In this case, we're going to set up um, some GRP resources that are available. Okay. So at this point, once that finishes, you should have something that looks like that. The remaining piece, oops, did I lose my, oh man. All right, so at this point we need to build a plan. Terraform works on plans. The plans represent things we want to do in our environment. Um, that's the plan. Um, note there's a cheat in the, the info file so that you can just pull it from my staged area. And it may be easier to see over there that way. Were we supposed to install the Terraform DRP? Yeah, sorry, I did both set sections gotcha. of that script up once. So from my info script, I grabbed all those pieces. And then if I go and grab that so I don't have to type it again, Right. Make it really. Okay, so that provider hasn't been made out okay. into Terraform yet. Okay. I have a meeting tomorrow with them to talk about some of this. Um, they. Tell them the tweets. Tell them you want it. Yeah, tell them you want it. Um, we are. I chose an interesting path for implementing it, and they hadn't seen that path used before, so we will be talking about that. Fair enough. Uh, we'll see what happens. It shouldn't be that big. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, I chose to use Golang Reflection so that I don't have to keep all my structures up to date in five places. They don't seem to like that. They want me to actually keep my structures in five places. Um, okay, we'll talk about it. Anyway, basically, very simple plan file in this case. We have two stanzas. We have a provider, which is DRP, saying use the DRP provider. We then pass in our username and password and URL. Because it's local, if you're running this locally, we'll use the local. You can put that remote. We also let you use token. You can say API underscore token. DRP has a whole token off system so that you don't have to pass around users and passwords. And the token system actually lets you limit access control. So you can say, like, this token, it can only mess with these machines and stuff like that. But in this case, let's go hog one. Um, the second stanza is basically saying create one machine, and we're going to put it in the workflow image. And as part of constructing it, we're going to add our Synthos Linux profile to the machine as we take control of it. It'll handle transitioning control and driving the system. Um, so there we go. Uh, sorry. In the info script, um, I had it there so you could pull it directly if you want to. Sorry. I'm hopping around way too fast. I, I ended up having an issue with the root terrible folder. I had to delete it and recreate it. I need to. Huh. Okay. So it didn't, yeah. Make sure that you create the root terrible file before you. Oh, I bet. Okay, so that's this part here. Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, Okay, very sorry. <laughs> All right. So once where'd my so once we have that, we should be able to do Terraform init, which says find my plugin. And then we can say Terraform plan, which should give me a view of what it's going to pull up and try and allocate. And I would recommend before you type Terraform apply, get the UX in the background. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Rob likes the UX auto moving. Okay. So, oh, sorry. It's. Terraform init, which initializes Terraform, make sure it finds all the plugins. Terraform plan, which basically says, what, what am I going to do? And then you can do Terraform apply. But before you do that, you want to have your UX on like the bulk action page. And I guess, actually, when I originally wrote this, we didn't know if we'd have two machines or one. So everybody has two. So if you change your count to from one to two, it'll do both at the same time. So I will do that just to be risky because, you know, nothing screams awesome like Okay, so we do the plan this time, and it says, okay. Um, <laughs> part of me inside will cry a little bit. Um, the second is, um, what will happen is it should grab two machines, do two of them, and the other 98 will actually say couldn't get resources. And I'll show you that in a second. But then once that's there, we can say Terraform apply. You say yes. And then you go back over to here, and you should see the system start transitioning through its various pieces. So in this case, it's off and running. So it's running image deploy. It already installed curtain. It's now using curtain to deploy the image. If you want, you can, I mentioned all, in fact, it's done and on my system. It's already imaged the system and started a reboot. I'm going to say that's the wrong one. I've got an error on here. That's strange for you to get half of it, so I don't, yeah. Let's see. This might be the wrong, no, this is the right one. Oh, there's an, here's another tab. Oh, nope. And I don't know which, Greg, I don't know which tab you have that has the. Hey, Rob, can you hear me? Uh, I know how to, I know how to do it without knowing. Oh, um, you know what we forgot to do? What? I did not work for me. 
It worked for me too. But then again, I might have done something with it. Hmm. Oh, no, it should work. <laughs> Brain exploded. I think I know why yours didn't work. Yeah, but I think it's supposed to be called Synthos Ah, uh, okay. It's okay. Um, so one of two things. We'll do this. We'll need to community or racking. My service needs to be used or not. Need to be revisited. All right. Well, uh, for whatever reason, the the initial work, the initial default workflow wasn't set to all the other ones. <laughs> okay. How did you do? Woo! One beer at least. <laughs> okay, beer for you. All right. Um, How long does it take? Uh, two, three minutes. Okay. Um, to access IPMI, we need to go back and do a step. We need to add the plugin so that we can access. Woohoo, Tim. <laughs> All right. So if you go to plugins, I want him to reboot in six. Oh, I can reboot? Uh, we're about to set it up so you can reboot it. Okay. So and that way you can reboot yours too if you want to. Uh, all of you can. Yep. So if you go to the plugin section, you can say add yep. packet IPMI. Mm -hmm. Okay. In there, you will be asked for two values and you want to remove a third. Remove the existing one because, yeah, just remove it. And then API key is in the info file. Uh, in the browser. Yeah, yeah, so take that packet API key. It's this 9Q number. Take that and you put that into there. And then in project ID, uh, you don't have to put this, but it would be nice just in case you do something accidental. It'll all go into the one spot so I know how to clean it up. <laughs> um, Sorry, uh, it's in that info script section here in that that file uh, info text. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> All right. So then if you add that, you should see don't, don't record that. So now you should see packet IP mice and that nice green checkbox. Yep. So now if you want to reboot your nodes, you should be able to say select your nodes and then choose the action and say power cycle. And that should reboot your nodes. Okay. One other thing you can do while you want to watch okay. under actions. Yeah, sorry, did I go too fast? Bulk action. I don't think he got part of it. So he didn't get part of it. He needs his reboot if he's separate machines because he doesn't have the same thing. Like the machines didn't go. Oh, he, you don't have the machines in your view at all. He does, but he, he has to go through a package. Oh, okay. Okay. So that I can fix. Well, I can try right there. What number are you? Student six, project one, two. Okay, I will reboot them <clears throat> for you. So if you just hit the action, you can say take action. <sighs> Dang it. Yeah, so when you select the two nodes, Six. There's six. And then I come up here and I say power cycle. Okay, so your machine should now come back up here in a minute. Strangely enough, what's their what's their set to right now? Are they set to image? Oh, you didn't have them. Yeah, in my info preferences, I had I was missing the uh, apparently I did select select the. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that all the other ones? But for that first one. <laughs> all right. So that would do it. Yeah. It, it found the machine created. It didn't set it to Okay. In fact, because you probably said stage, 
that at least discovered and created it, but then didn't do the packet parts yeah. or the Terraform parts. So you probably got the lovely message of saying you have no resources for Terraform. That's exactly. No machine. Right. So that to answer her question, what do you get when you don't have machines? Terraform will tell you, I don't have machines for you. Okay. All right. So here we go. So your machine should show up. Their machines. And then I'll Terraform apply. Apply. See the look. Now <laughs> we hope. The point of this is that, and we're running close to the end of time. You should see something like this, right? It took a, mine took three minutes to deploy both machines. Right? I now have simply seven machines. I can go get on their consoles, right? If I go to the right machine, I can say, okay, what's this guy's console? So if I, if I, my Mac mouse is correctly, quit helping me. I don't really want to add that to contacts. So if I look at this, what have I done? I can SSH to that. Uh, I can dream about SSHing to that. Oh. Private key. Valid, yeah. Right. Maybe. Oh, come on. Oh. There we go. My key is everywhere. Uh, supposedly. Um, so I should be able to. Part of the Terraform provider is also that we manage the lifecycle of the system itself so that you should be able to then do Terraform destroy. And you can say yes. And then as that goes through, notice the system gets put back into Discover, drives through its system, gets back put in the discovery state. Right now, if I run that Terraform script again, Right, if I say terraform apply, it'll say I don't have resources because the systems are still allocated. They're going through their cleanup process. The idea is that I could create a workflow that's also used to decommission. Right, I worry about wiping this, so let me create a workflow that wipes this and then puts it back in. Right, so that's the power of the workflow. Right? The idea is that. Actions that you need to automate in a controlled fashion, you can drive to the systems through and end up with one. Um, that's kind of, well, we're almost out of time. Um, and so at that point, ask questions. Faithful, thank you for making it through. I'm glad I was dead. People got it all the way down. Two, three. Almost, if I only would be. I must look, I don't know, maybe they've got so, um, up or something. No. Strangely enough, there's a whole bunch of YouTube videos that we have. Um, the documentation also talks about um, guided tours. There's a quick start guides. Um, like, I have it set up on my Mac. So I can use VirtualBox and DRP running locally to test and play with it. Um, I think Rob does it on Linux with VirtualBox as well. Um, we even have an insane guy who does KVM instances directly and just does it that way. Right? Um, Victor, our another one of our engineers. 
But the point is, the from a testing, deploying, use, the idea is that we want to try and make it where you can test it locally, validate it, then move it to a high quality system, and move it to then generate usage and then drive it. Um, this has been an attempt to be more hands on so you can try and see it and not have something that we've done it once. Um, there's a whole lot of things you can do. You can build your own stages, you can build your own tasks, kind of like I've talked about a little bit. Um, we've talked about tasks being anything from uh, discovery to like Rob's that he built, something to do LDP discovery. So it figures out what LDP information is on the port, it records those parameters, and then we have a UI extension that actually can let you see the collection of those kind of things, right? That's an example. But you can build all of that yourself through the templating system. So you can see things like, I mentioned our traditional kickstarts, right? If you're familiar with kickstarts, Right, this is our kickstart system. If you're familiar with that, you can see. But you'll see there's these little special, I'm gonna walk over here, parts to the thing. They're, they're template expansions that allow you to reference parameters on the node. So you can inject things like that one's which disk you want to install on, right? So if it's like, dang it, my node always have the install disk as SVG. Right, there's a parameter you can set on a machine, on a profile, or a global basis that lets you override that kind of setup. Right? The whole point is this whole system is templatized that way so that you can do that with your DHCP options. So you can put some template expansion in that button. You can do it inside of the basic Kickstarter elements. In some cases, we also have tasks that represent installing things. So, for example, one of the ones that we let people play with, and I'll include real quick, is uh, Crib, which is our Kubernetes installer. Um, kind of a toy a little <laughs> bit. But the idea is that it represents installing an application on top. So it adds some additional stages, things like Crib install, which knows how to install and configure Kubernetes. So those are interesting because they know how to do it as a cluster action. And so if you follow the YouTube video for that, it'll actually create a master and then you join the new YouTube. And that's where those atomic parameters get used in the example. So you see you like how do I make cluster management where I need to synchronize things, right? All those things are kind of encompassed and drivable through the system. Um, any questions?